Compliments have that positivity that's infectious, that allows other people to feel good about themselves. And as Johnny said, when you recognize a personality trait in someone, complimenting that is a really powerful way to start that connection. <laughs> Now, this is one of our favorite topics. Yeah. And if we were to hop in the Wayback Machine, the whole entire premise of starting this podcast was about talking with strangers and learning how to talk more effectively with the opposite sex, of course, but strangers in essence. And sure. I know as an introvert, I've had my struggles with this exact thing. And I know a lot of extroverts who also struggle with this exact thing. Why? Because we now have these devices in our pockets that easily distract us. Yeah, well, we were just talking about that on the way over here to do this show, which is we are now getting even 10 years later from starting this or 13 years of starting this podcast is we're we're now getting more and more comf comfortable with asynchronous communication rather than synchronous conversation. Because most of our dialogue, most of our conversations are, are being are being held online. And of course, we didn't know where any of this was going when we first started, and but yet here we are. And our conversation skills have gotten worse. Our connection has gotten worse. And now, because of the technology and because of us following it with connection in mind, we are now seeing the sickness that is, I guess, a symptom of that. And one of the things that we were also discussing, and I think it was Johan Hari who mentioned that these conversations, though we're still having them, are equal to say, if I'm hungry to have a Big Mac, like I'm not gonna be hungry, but I'm certainly not getting the, nutrition, the nutritional value that I desperately need in order to be, to, for that to be good. And our conversations, these asynchronous conversations that are being held online are those Big Macs. Yeah, well, synchronous conversation is the most difficult, right? You have to be in the moment, you have yes. to be present, you have to be listening to what the other person is <laughs> saying, and you have to tune out that inner dialogue that's going on. Asynchronous conversations, well, those we're used to now, and, and a lot of us default to that, right? It's mm -hmm. easier to text someone, it's easier to Facebook message, even look at the dating apps. Most people, the data shows, they stay on the app. They don't have synchronous conversation. You know, and the, here's what I was thinking. This goes along with this. When I was young, and when, and when you first start to become a teenager, it's like 11, 12, 13, you start getting friends, and then you're, then you're always on the phone with them. So the phone in my house had this long cord and would run underneath, the, down the hallway, underneath the door. That's how my dad would find out if I was having conversations with my friends at night. But I remember talking to them, and I remember thinking about what the future were, would be like if you were able to see the person that you're speaking to. And, and how glorious that moment would be. Now, when I get a FaceTime call on my phone, you better believe I'm not gonna answer that thing. My, in fact, I don't answer it and I text back What's saying, text? What, yeah. what, do you, what do you want? <laughs> Why so, are you FaceTiming me, bro? So this idea of this invention that would make all of our lives so much better, it is now here and I don't care for it. And. Even when my, you know, every once in a while, my, my dad will call me uh, with, and I'll answer him. Uh, he wants to see my face. I can understand that, um, certainly with loved ones. But, if, you know, to have a, a regular homie call me up with FaceTime, like, the, what are you doing? Well, it's funny because, you know, the impetus for starting the show 13 years ago in my basement in Ann Arbor to now, and I think back to that journey and obviously – who we've had on the show and the guests and the relationships that I've built. You know, one of the common questions that I get is, well, do you practice what you preach? Mm -hmm. you, what makes you an expert? How, how is it that you are the expert on talking to strangers? And if I look back over the last 13 years at my relationships, mm -hmm. look at my fiance, complete strangers met in Las Vegas, Sure. business partner, complete strangers met in DC. Mm -hmm. My friends in LA, complete strangers, met at holiday parties, sure. met in elevators, 
met at a, a random house party that we happened to be invited to. I mean, the list goes on. And so many of us are feeling stuck with toxic friends. We have that uh, topic on the podcast, a popular episode last year. Feeling stuck with the same people they went to school with, the same coworkers, all because they haven't mastered the art of talking to strangers. They haven't been willing to put themselves out there. And what we wanna do today is talk a little bit about the science behind why it's scary and, and why we're struggling in this area and the loneliness epidemic, but then also look at the flip side and the impact that talking to strangers has. Yes. It's created business opportunities for us. Certainly. It's created relationships, romance, you name it. So we live and breathe it. And now it's something that, yes, as an introvert, it doesn't fire me up, but I do get excited when I have those one great conversation, those two or three of great course. conversations with strangers that make it all worth it. Well, we've said on this show a million times now, which is that all the most important events in your life is going to be centered around, there's gonna to have to be a conversation for those moments. Now, that conversation can be held online. However, in order for the trust, the loyalty, the impact, the commitment to be there, there needs to be that in real life, face-to-face -face conversation where you having it, can feel so much more fulfilled and safer than of not having it. And one of the other things that we, we now know is to the science that goes along with that is even if I'm on FaceTime, I'm still unable to pick up all the facial cues and be able to mimic them to have that connection. And, and that's, Unfortunately, that's just the facts. Well, I remember. So Amy's family lives in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And of course, I wanted to ask her dad for her hand, but I, I could not. Yeah. Our cross, we're not going to pass. We weren't going to cross paths here in L.A. Or, or me in Minnesota. So I had to default to FaceTime. Mm -hmm. And I remember I have the ring. I'm all excited to show him and, and share the story. And then her mom joined in on the FaceTime. And it was one of those moments where like, I still couldn't get a good read, even though I'm looking sure. at the video. You can't pick up on all the signals, the nonverbal communication that we talk about on the show. And when we rely so heavily on technology and it's become the default for everything, delivery, we basically go on our phone for that dopamine. And of course, we've now become accustomed to asynchronous communication. Oh, set your phone down. I'll think of something witty. I'll reply back. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I don't want to deal with my friend right now. I'll respond in a couple hours. And we're almost allergic to the phone. We're allergic to the synchronous conversations that we need to be having to really start connecting and opening up opportunity. Mm -hmm. Now, why is it that talking to someone you don't know is so scary? Well, we've talked about this before, but basically it's built into our DNA. We survived because of it. Evolutionarily yes. speaking, we were tribal and if a stranger from another tribe comes over well he or she probably wanted to do you some harm wanted your resources wanted something from you that was not a very positive outcome so of course we're going to stick to our tribe we're going to stick to the familiar faces we're going to stick to the people we know now fast forward to today that software is still running you know we laugh about getting in an elevator and just how many people won't look at you won't mm -hmm. say anything won't and we're neighbors. We literally live across the hall from each other and we're not engaging with people or in line or wherever the case may be. And we talked about this digital device security blanket. Mm -hmm. So one of my goals for 2020 is to break that habit in myself. Okay. I, I do it in the backseat of Ubers. I do it when I'm at an event where I'll just, I'm alone and it's just easier to pull out my device. <clears throat> And I, I want to break that as a habit that sure. that security blanket is keeping me from the interactions that I know lead to all these amazing things in my life. Well, yeah, those that's opportunities that are being wasted. And when you are good at this, when you are comfortable with with socialization, you create opportunities. Now you could still create these opportunities online as well. I mean, everyone is running seemingly running businesses online now. However, 
in order to advance those businesses, there's going to be these conversations. There's going to be meetings. There's going to be lunches and, and let's hash it out over drinks. That's going to happen. And well, even us, we, we work in a business. We have a lot of remote contractors and team members. Yes. And guess what we still try to do? Meet in one location, fly to them or fly them out to us because it's so impactful. And here's the thing. In the modern day lifestyle, we no longer live in these close knit communities. No. We are not with our tribe members all the time. Most of us have family members spread out. Very few of us are living in that ancestral state. And of course, we're now wondering, well, why do I feel lonely? Why do I feel like I don't belong? Why do I feel disconnected? And at the same time, everyone at this point probably agrees for the most part, there's nothing wrong with talking to strangers. Unlike that advice you got as a kid, there's nothing wrong with talking to strangers. In fact, talking to the person on the bus sitting next to you, talking to the person in the elevator, no harm. And in fact, there's benefit to it. Mm -hmm. Science shows, and it certainly beats staring at the phone. I know myself, when I, even as an introvert, when I've had those great conversations, I walk away inspired, feeling really great. And scientists call this minimal social interactions. And they fulfill a basic human need of sociability. In fact, they create intimacy. In a study done by Gillian Sandstorm and Elizabeth Dunn that's titled, Is Efficiency Overrated? Minimal social interactions lead to belonging and positive effect. And this was published in 2013. And the researchers split participants into two groups. The control group was asked to just order their coffee like a normal person. And the other group was asked to go in and actually have a chat with the person making your coffee, the barista. And guess which participants left the coffee shop feeling better? Uh, it's an easy guess. Yeah, it wasn't the control group. And similar studies have been done on commuter trains and waiting rooms. It's all the same. This is called fleeting intimacy or street intimacy. It allows us to feel connected and that sense of belonging that we're all craving with very, very small doses. It's nothing heavy lifting. It's nothing that should scare us, but we're not doing it. We're not engaging in it. I have heard of that referred to as your social biome. And the study that I had saw, I was just released in, in on Inc.com. And it was, it, Basically, they have all the research and data back now that shows that the longer you have these fleeting interactions, the the more the less stress, the more happy, and the and the overall uh, security and and safety that you feel with within your environment. Yeah, I mean, it, without a doubt, that intimacy is something we crave. That connection is something we crave. And it starts with talking to strangers. Mm -hmm. for, for most of our lives, we are going to be walking into situations where we don't know someone. And guess what? Good news. It's actually easier to talk to strangers. And we're gonna talk about a little bit later some simple ways that we can do this, but why is it easier? Well, number one, we can assume the other person doesn't know our backstory. <laughs> So yeah. we have free reign to create that narrative with someone new and we have to explain everything to do it. You know, how many of us spend time with our significant others, our best friends, our siblings, and we know every freaking story. We know the words, we know exactly where it's going to go. It's not interesting. I'm sure that both of us can uh, repeat stories that each one of us have told each other over the 13 years several times. Then. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, we, we laugh with all of our clients on Saturday when we're wrapping up the boot camp at graduation dinner. And, and of course, everyone wants to hear stories. What was the craziest boot camp experience? What did you have to deal with? What's been the most fun? Who have you met while out on boot camp? Right? All those great stories. And it's now at a point where we finish each other's stories. Mm. I can start it. You can finish it. it we know the stories inside and out. Why? Okay. Because we experienced them together for the most part. We've told them together. Yep. We know the other person's story. So with people we're familiar with, people we're close with, we don't have that luxury, right? And of course, if we start explaining, if I start explaining something, you're like, dude, I already know this. What, 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 come on, stop wasting my time here. But with strangers, we have that ability to create our narrative, explain everything to them, and we have really have nothing to lose. It's a, it's a use it or lose it situation. 
I hear this all the time. Well, I, I'm, I'm witty online. I got this going on there. And I had these conversations. Oh, we get there. the zingers online. Right? And, and we've heard it all before. But there is that. And, and of course, there is benefits to being able to put that together. But you have time as a luxury to be able to put this stuff together. Sure, the, the zinger in the moment is going to be better, but it still works on the long term. However, let's have you trying to hold court or in a conversation, having some verbal sparring going on with somebody that you're interested in or somebody that you're creating a relationship with so that uh, re those relationships can be forged to help your businesses go. And without doing that, you're, those opportunities are slipping through your hands. And this last point, which I, I love, and, and it's sort of counterintuitive, but it, it really is how human nature works. People are much more likely to open up to strangers in these situations. And we'll actually cover that in some more detail a little bit later, but you'd be surprised. Some of the shocking information I've gotten from complete strangers, conversations with Uber drivers, conversations in an elevator, people are willing to share if we are present, if we're willing to actually take that first step and ask them how their day is genuinely and ask them something about their lives that's important to them. You know, this is important to us. We build a business around it. It's also important to humankind because it's for, there's health benefits that are wrapped around it as well. And so I always try to make it a point of, to put myself out there a bit wherever I'm at, even, even if it were waiting for the car outside of this studio, I'll end up chatting with somebody cause I see something of interest. Um, but I can't tell you how many times I've heard somebody ask me, well, how'd you guys meet? Oh, that guy. Oh, we met him on the street a few years ago. Wait, what? You just met him on the street. Yeah. I just started bullshitting with him because of X, X, and right, X. Like the shoes. <laughs> he was standing in Shake Shack. I seen him a couple times. I mean, it's, it's just how that goes. And people are like, wait, you guys didn't know each other and you met each other on the street. Well, yeah, his shoes were appealing or he was wearing something unique and I took interest in it. And I've built so many relationships around those types of, of run-ins. They're normal to me. However, I'm, I've also seen them, especially for the younger generation coming to program where they find that so fascinating and so bizarre because there was no, there was no pre-context to, to any of it. Right. Well, there was no reason for you to cross paths. It was serendipitous, but that's the thing that creates opportunities that grows your network, that grows your social capital. All those amazing things we've been talking about on the podcast, all blossom from strangers having conversations with you. But a lot of us, and this is something that I want to dispel because I feel like you know, people listening to this are like, oh, but I do talk to strangers. No, I, I'm open and I'm extroverted and I don't need this sort of thing. And the people who take your program must be complete shut-ins. And that's just not the case. No. The truth of the matter is we all are running on autopilot for much of our day-to-day -day lives. Yep. We are not looking for these opportunities and we are easily distracted by devices or other things in our lives. And for us, it's easy to look back and be like, well, I look around and most of my friends were complete strangers to me. I certainly have the friends from school. I have the friends that I grew up with, but most of my friends, my business partner, my fiance, absolute stranger. There was no close tie. There was no one in my network that set it up yet. These are some of the best relationships I have in my life. And what's going to happen after you graduate, you're going to get a piece of paper that you're going to want to use to advance your career as, as far as possible as you can. And a lot of times you're going to have to move to a place that is going to help with that career, or at least put you in the mix of a, allowing yourself to have those opportunities to do that, which means you're going to be a, at a place where your buddies from college or high school or the kids you grew up in are not around, which means you're going to have to start from scratch and you're going to have to build relationships of the stranger that you met sitting next to at a bar because he had this, uh, a, a pendant of a, of, of a team that you root for. And now 
there's so much opportunity to practice this skill. This is not something that you need to be in a specific environment to practice that you have to go drive cross town. Literally there are strangers all around us. There are ample opportunities to practice these skills. We're going to cover it a little bit later. And here's a few factors that should actually make some introverts smile and make it a little bit easier for them. You're not looking for prolonged conversation nope. with strangers. So you're not going to drain those metaphorical batteries of socialization that we're talking about. And you're in no way required to go deep with what you're talking about. No one's asking you to pour your heart out and be super vulnerable with strangers. It is light. It is simple. It is not complicated. So it shouldn't be taxing on us introverts. And it's perfectly acceptable to end a conversation at any point without being rude because you don't owe it to anyone. No, nope. you're strangers. You're in passing. Now that's the best part. There are absolutely no expectations. And when we start to remove expectations, we start to remove pressure from us and hopefully start viewing all the opportunity around us. We can start planting some new seeds, growing a new garden, removing some of the toxic influences from our life. Now, let me get 10 seconds here. If you've been enjoying the show over the last couple of years or over the last 13 years even, and taking what you've been learning, these practical tips and putting them into practice and getting value each week, your next step might be coming out to LA for a week long boot camp. Imagine diving deeper into these conversation skills that we're talking about here and gaining the courage and the power to have charismatic conversations with strangers and diving deeper to become a top performer with these advanced social skills. I'd love to chat with you. Head on over to the slash apply to learn more about our programs. Now, I want to talk about the simple techniques that we can use to open up this world of opportunity. Hopefully you've now heard all the opportunity around you and realizing from us that we actually walk the walk. We're talking to strangers and of course, making great relationships with said strangers. And when people ask us about the guests we've had on the show or how we've had these opportunities in our lives, nine times out of 10, I could point to a stranger at some point making introductions, coming into our circle and all of a sudden magic happening. So the first easiest way to get this ball moving in the right direction is to take your eyes off your phone, off your iPad, off your device, off your Apple watch, whatever screen you have in front of your face and just gaze briefly around the room at the people around you and see if it's reciprocated. Now, can we just look into that pun intended just for a second? How many people, when they heard that, just, we're just going to stare at random people. We're just going to look in their direction. What, what if they're looking in my direction? Well, that's how these things start. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? There's absolutely nothing wrong with glancing at strangers and strangers glancing back. And f in fact, <laughs> for up until this time period, I mean, that's what we did. We go out to social engagements and you scan the room for people who look fun, warm, attractive, interesting. And your first point to that is to make the contact and maybe they smile or maybe they put their head down in a, in a sh sh shy way. And you're like, Oh, it's on. I'm going to go over and say hello. It this reminds me of, it. of the high school dance, right? <laughs> Your first high school dance, you get there, the girls are on one side of the gymnasium, yep. the boys are on the other and you kind of talking amongst each other. And then all of a sudden you start glancing over. Okay. Who's kind of looking back here. Oh, who's, who's smiling. Oh, I'm going to walk up and ask her to dance. I wonder at what point we are going to see a trend phase craze, whatever you want to call it of bars, taking people's phones as they enter. That it's it, happened. It's, it's there. It's we're happened. now happening. This. Oh, nightclubs have been removing them for obvious reasons, but also bars and they've also put scramblers up so you can't use your cell phone in the bar. So it's basically there useless. Go. There you go. I Complete mean, it wasn't dead zone. I, it wasn't, it was, oh, it was going to happen sooner or later. Yeah, because listen, these devices, these screens well, are taking away from this exact moment we're talking about. If I'm putting in the money to to blow out this this nightclub and with the, the production and the ambiance and the excitement where I want people to come back weekly, I don't want a room that is staring at their screens. You're killing it. You're killing it. You're killing the vibe. 
And what are people going to say? Yeah, I was there. It was all right. It was all right. You, you have not allowed yourself to take on everything that was built. Meticulously put meticulously together. Meticulously put together. We've had club builders on this show, our buddy Derek, and we know the painstaking efforts that go into the layout, the design, and every piece to that place. And you're going to walk in and get on your phone? I don't think so. It's happening. Uh, not enough. It should be happening more. It's going to. But the screens are definitely distracting. And, and as Johnny was saying, there's a difference between a gaze and a stare. A stare will more likely cause a negative reaction. As Phoebe Ellsworth and her team showed in their study, the stare is a stimulus to flight in human subjects. Yep. A series of field experiments. What they showed was when we stare with intent, we actually strike that fight or flight mechanism in the other person. They feel the tension. So what we're talking about here is a gaze with a smile. And we're looking to see if that smile is reciprocated, mm -hmm. right? A simple signal, but we're not doing it enough. Now, here's one that's like, Oh my God, brain dead simple. How many got, people are listening to this right now thinking, well, a good thing I got Tinder. I don't have to worry about it. Either. <laughs> I don't have to stare at anybody <laughs> except my screen. <laughs> <laughs> Saying hello or how are you or similar phrases. You know, it, it's funny because I have friends that I've met simply by saying hello, mm -hmm. standing in line at a networking event for a refreshment. Yep. And people ask later, like, how'd you guys meet? Well, I said hello. He said hello. Whoa, that's how you met? Yeah, that's how people have met for ages. But for some reason, even the people Googling and finding our site, they're like, well, I can't say hello. I need something more magical to start up the conversation. But hello works. And this is called phatic communication. It's almost without factual information or meaning. And it has tremendous social value because the value lies in acknowledging the other person. By simply saying, how are you, hello, we acknowledge them, we enter their reality, and of course, they reciprocate. It's simple. There's, there's other ways to go about it as well. High fives, cheers, a lot of these, these are, these are all fat at communication. Now, number three here, I love. I do this all the time. And the reason I love it so much is because it forces me to be present in the moment. Mm -hmm. You can't make a casual comment about the shared space or experience if you're not actually experiencing it right so in order to find something to strike up conversation about whether it's the cocktails or whether it's the massive line at the networking event or whether it's the fact that the bus was late whatever the case may be you have to be fully present off your device paying attention to the world around you and the experience to to have a shared comment on it think about this when if you're listening to this at home think about the last time you left your house without your phone when was the last time? And you, didn't run back immediately. <laughs> didn't run back immediately. When was the last time you left the house without your phone for an extended amount of time? Let's say four hours. It's been years, hasn't it? Not purposely, yeah. I've, I've done it accidentally. And the whole time I've been feeling phantom vibrations in Whoa. my pocket and wondering what's going on with my phone. Of course. And then, you know, there's a, of course, there's a part of us that goes, that says to ourselves, well, People used to be able to do this all the time. This was the norm. How did that, how did they ever the get along? Singularity is here. <laughs> we are part device. <laughs> now, making this casual comment about the shared space or experience, this is called triangulation. And it's powerful because it starts a conversation with low commitment. You're not talking about the other person. You're not putting any pressure on anybody, or you're not even talking about yourself. You're literally talking about a third element, separate of two of you. And if it's the bus, if it's a pink poodle, whatever the case may be, it's again, very low commitment for the other person to join in. And the best part about it is it puts you in the moment. It makes you more present. Now it's not searching for the craziest thing, but even the most simple of observations can strike up that conversation, whether it's the traffic in LA, which of course is causal comment constantly, whether it's the traffic in LA, which is of course a casual comment for pretty much everybody these days or the line, how long things are taking or how much you enjoy the drink. It opens up a world of conversation that creates these opportunities that we're talking about. Now, number four is one that we recommend a lot in our programs as well. And this is a compliment. Now it needs to be genuine. It needs to be respectful. Sure. And we 
don't need to go into the difference between a crass compliment and a real compliment. But when you notice something about someone else that you appreciate sharing that, whether it's their taste in music, their taste in clothes, the way they did their hair, you would be amazed at how powerful just a simple compliment is at striking up that conversation, allowing the other person to feel good. And if you're a little bit worried about how that will come off, you can use what we call a trade compliment, which is just, it's, it's slightly deeper. It's beyond the surface. And so it shows that you are actually paying attention and it's not some superficial thing you just said to get somebody's attention. Yeah. And compliments of course can be a little terrifying, sure. right? You don't want to come across too strong. You don't want to come across as hitting on someone, but Compliments have that positivity that's infectious that allows other people to feel good about themselves. And as Johnny said, when you recognize a personality trait in someone, complimenting that is a really powerful way to start that connection. So in our boot camps, our social skills training programs, we film you interacting with our coaches because a lot of what we're talking about here, a lot of these signals, nonverbal communication, what our body is doing when nervous, we're not aware of. No. We're focused either on our internal monologue of what's going on upstairs, or we're focusing on the other person, everything that they're doing. So we film you interacting, and that's video work that Johnny's referring to. And what do you see in this video work, Johnny? Well, the tape doesn't, first of all, the tape doesn't lie. You can't escape, you can't escape video. But along with that is, let's just say that you are very comfortable bantering with your friends and you're pretty witty and you always got some remark and a zinger and, if that is your, your go-to humor and you're a little bit nervous or you're, you're out where you're not the most comfortable, so you focus inward, you're going to go to what you already know. And so it's that kind of humor that is usually is your go-to and that comes out. And how many times week after week do our video girls who, who help us with this video go, where did you get that? And that is the most horrible thing I've heard or I'm so offended and 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 I uh, I love this this is my favorite there is this is the light bulb going off because for who for whoever it is is doing the video work who is participating they now have seen something that they have been doing for most of their adult life and getting poor results because of it and have finally now has I've had that pointed out so they can fix it. And it's not so easy to fix because this is reinforced programming that you have been doing to yourself for years. It needs to be rewired, but at least you now know the cause of the bad first impression. Yeah. We have to make it conscious to fix it. Yeah. And a lot of us are doing these things subconsciously. And when, we are starting to pay attention to strangers. That's when these opportunities start to appear. As Johnny was saying on video work, unfortunately, a lot of us were so focused internally on our own dialogue, on our own behaviors, the way we're being judged that we don't see all these other opportunities to be present, to strike up conversations with strangers. And this is one of the concepts that we've covered on the show before, but I want to talk about because it, it just works so well. And that is the conversation formula. And a lot of us think, Oh, I'll just ask someone for something. And that's a great way to strike up a conversation, but it's transactional, right? You're asking for directions. You're asking for the time and you get that answer and it's a dead end. It doesn't really go anywhere. What we focus on is ask a question that is not transactional. Ask something about them, ask about their opinion, and then share your opinion back in the form of a statement. So you ask a question, you listen to their answer, and you reply in the form of a statement. And that eases itself in naturally into a conversation because one, you're taking interest in them. And two, you're showing a willingness to share something about yourself. And your, your statement should not be, oh, that's cool because you've just shut it back down. The, this whole point was to open it up for dialogue. It needs to be a shared statement about yourself and incorporating their answer. And what we, we see a lot is if you're nervous, uh, the questions will just tend to keep coming because, well, you've gotten something out, they answered. So next question, 
Uh, but you can only ask so many questions before the conversation starts to get weird. It'll start to collapse on itself because you're not contributing to it as with the other person. And we use this jelly bean jar. Brene Brown uses it with vulnerability. But if, if I'm chatting with AJ and he's asking me questions, every time I answer, I have to throw jelly beans at the jar. If he's not giving me a, a, a shared statement contributing to this conversation, well, after a few questions, I'm the only one contributing. And then this is why it will begin to feel uh, as an interrogation for me. And if it feels like an interrogation on my end, I am not going, I am not going to want to continue the conversation. Yeah, you're going to start to withdraw. So, and you'll see it on video. Yes. First, they'll withdraw with their body language, crossing their arms, yep. leaning a little bit back, looking around the room. And they're going to start to withdraw with their attention. They're going to start to pay less attention to what you're saying because they feel like you're taking information. And this is key. That's cool. That's awesome. That's rad. It's fine as long as you add a because and say why. Yes. Give them the reason you think that's cool, why that's rad. Oh, it's rad because I grew up two towns over. That's so cool because that was my first favorite band growing up. Whatever the case may be, you have to say because and answer the why you feel that way, not just agree with them. In improv, and this is an, an incredible tactic, it's called the yes and tactic. So you answer with an emphatic yes, show some enthusiasm, and then you can give your statement afterwards. Now, the conversation formula I love, I use it constantly, it's one of our guys and gals favorite tools to use to strike up conversations it should be in your back pocket using questions and allowing that answer to be utilized through a shared statement as johnny said so question answer statement listen to their answer reply in a statement that simple formula i found i haven't even had to ask more than two questions three max before the other person starts taking interest in me because i've won been curious about them, showcase some interest in what they're doing or what's going on around us. And two, I've showed a willingness to share. Now it's not deep vulnerability. You don't have to get into your whole backstory, your autobiography, but those two things, curiosity and a willingness to share opens up these opportunities for conversations with strangers. So if, if you're listening to this and that your first thoughts are, I don't like going out because it always ends up in small talk and not really going anywhere. That's on you. That's bad tactics. That is bad tools. That is bad conversation that you are able to fix. People who are out in these situations socially, they want to enjoy. Everybody wants to have fun and enjoy great conversation. But if you are lacking in those tools, well, of course the conversations are not going to be good. At some point, you have to take responsibility for those conversations. Yeah, let's talk about common pitfalls here with people who hate small talk. Number one, common pitfall is they're not sharing. Nope. So the conversation doesn't ever get outside of small talk. Nope. You're not sharing the things that interest you, so it feels small. It feels like it's just a trade of information that's useless. So focusing on sharing what matters to you. Second thing, you're not asking the right questions. You're asking the same boring questions that everyone is expecting. Why don't you ask someone, what are you excited about? What are you looking forward to in 2020? And if we're not disclosing information that's interesting, it's small talk. If we're not asking the right questions, we're focused on small talk. And the last thing that I want to say is we don't need to be allergic to small talk. Small talk leads to big talk if you're willing to take control. Now, if you're listening to this and you're saying, oh man, I hate small talk. I can never seem to break out of it you might want to check out the rest of our toolbox episodes. <laughs> we talk exactly about this phenomenon. There's no reason to feel stuck in small talk. And there's certainly too much bashing of small talk. Great conversations have all started with small talk. And don't, you cannot rely on the other person to do all the work. If you made the attempt to go over there and say, hello, you have to be willing to take the responsibility of the conversation to get it moving. Cause let's look at it. Let's look at it for what it is. You saw somebody that you wanted to say hello to. So you made the effort to go over there. Now that person is in a position where first they have to make sure that they're safe. They don't know you. Why are you coming over? They're going to be a little bit 
you're going to put them in a position to be slightly nervous. Right, and small talk disarms. It's and, and small talk disarms. And so we need that. However, if you start asking questions and you're not contributing to the conversation and you're not willing to take responsibility for your end, you've put all of the pressure on the other person who is already nervous because you walked over there and said hello. Right. So you've now, that amplified is, that pressure. Do you see how selfish that is? I hope so. Let's sit with that for a minute. Because <laughs> yeah. a, a, a lot of us don't realize that. A lot no. of us are a little bit blinded of like, well, hey, I walked over. Why is this person not giving me more information? Why is this person not disarmed and willing to share? Well, what happens with that? They go over, they make an attempt, they don't contribute, they put the other person in a position to be a bit nervous, so they're on guard. It doesn't very it doesn't go well. And then they come back and go, Well, that person was a jerk. <laughs> oh, now you're gonna dump off the conversation not going anywhere because 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 they're jerks. Because they're stuck up. I mean the audacity. Now, this last point we wanna make. And, and this is a really powerful one. It's scary. It's intimidating. Yes, I will admit that, but it's a really powerful one. And, and I experienced this. It was a little contrived, but it, it really was remarkable. So I went to a networking event up in the hills here in LA and the host, a uh, buddy of mine, he had everyone sit down. And of course we don't know each other. So everyone thinks icebreakers. Everyone thinks, oh, let's just do the small talk and get it over with. As we're sitting in a circle, he goes, all right, I want you to share two things with the group, what you're excited about and what you're struggling with. And it was a little tense. Sure. Everyone kind of was like, whoa, I, d I didn't want to get that vulnerable soon. And he's like, I'll go first. He's like, I'm excited about this new app that I'm developing, but I'm really struggling with building out a remote team. And everyone was like, oh, okay. And then as th we went around the circle, the struggles got more and more real. I'm struggling with time management. I'm struggling financially. I'm struggling in my relationship. And you start to see the power in leading with vulnerability. When you are willing to tell a stranger and share something deep with you, something personal first, that stranger is more likely to reciprocate and follow your lead than you would imagine. And it was remarkable. We were complete strangers. The group didn't know each other. And he was like, sit down. We're not doing the normal name tag icebreaker stuff. And immediately after that, going around the circle, everyone felt so connected and the conversations were really transformational. People were helping mm -hmm. each other. They were getting excited about overcoming roadblocks. And that event out of all the events I've been to really stood out for me to illustrate this point that if we can lead with a little bit of vulnerability, Right? It doesn't have to be your deepest, darkest. It doesn't have to be your deepest, darkest secrets. But if you're willing to lead with a little vulnerability, I'm struggling with this. I'm frustrated with that. I'm concerned about this. You'd be surprised at how easily that opens up conversations with strangers, and it's not boring small talk. Something has to give in, in those situations, and it was good of your buddy to to put that together and start that. It, it, it brings me to uh, remembering the time that you and Amy did the murder mystery party and you invited me and I was out of my element because there wasn't many people there that I knew. However, I wanted to participate. You guys asked me, so of, of course. And uh, hey, I'm always uh, interested in, in that kind of stuff. So I was laughing because the first, I guess, hour was just people arriving. And, be, and because there was a lot of people from di several different uh, social groups, everyone got there, hung out with their clicks and were on their phone within their circle and staring at their screen. And what I laugh about is, of course, then we played the game and everyone was loosened up and everyone was now knew each other and had a great conversation. And be, the game went really well because everyone had a character to play. Right, they could put on their social mask. Yeah. That would alleviate the pressure of actually having to connect with people. Now, my question goes to how long would it have taken to have to get to that place if we if that game wasn't in, in, inserted for us to play? It could have been all evening. I mean, that's just where we are now. Yeah, and I think the other side of the coin is when you're willing to offer up some information, 
right? Instead of taking information from the other person, but when you're willing to offer up a piece of vulnerability, there is a reciprocity in that, that it is hidden that a lot of people don't realize because we're so afraid. And we have a great experiment that was run on this exact fact. You are more likely to share something personal with a stranger than you are with close connections. It's strange. You know, I was talking to uh, a client on the phone yesterday and he was like, you know, my friends jokingly refer to me as a safe that they can't crack because I just, I, I build the shell, I put up a wall and these are his friends calling him a safe. Mm -hmm. But that's so low stakes with strangers. It's so low stakes with someone you don't know to share something a little vulnerable. There is not the implicit judgment attached. They don't know you. You don't have to walk away from it feeling as intentionally, as intensely judged as you do with people, you know, now, Sidney Girard in self disclosure and experimental analysis of the transparent self wrote disclosure begets disclosure. In short, it's actually easier to be vulnerable around strangers and they'll reciprocate much more frequently than our friends will. And that's because it's an interaction with someone that you're not likely to see again. So there is not this pressure that we put on ourselves around being vulnerable, being open. And in fact, if you can lead with a little bit of vulnerability, some light vulnerability, as we talk about, you'd be amazed at how amazingly deep those conversations get without the small talk that everyone seems to dread. Now, here's where it gets a little counterintuitive. This doesn't work with just facts. All right. The reciprocity goes out of the window if we're just sharing facts. And that's because facts are less interesting than learning something personal about the other person, right? So it's not facts. The vulnerability comes with the emotion, sharing a little bit of your emotional state, whether you're excited, whether you're nervous, whether you're anxious. In fact, we've laughed, right? How many times have we gone out with clients and said, just be honest. Hey, I'm a little nervous. That was yeah. my first time in LA. I'm a little nervous. Calling out the emotion that you're feeling is like a breath of fresh air. When everyone else is trying to be someone they're not and put on this social mask, you can be real with what you're feeling and share it with a stranger. And it changes the dynamic of that conversation. So in, in prepping for this episode, I wanted to spell out what you get when you're good with conversation, when you're experienced with it, when you've put in the work compared to what you get when you're not. And so that you can see how incredibly important this is. So one of the things is being able to control the emotions in the conversation, right? So if you're chatting with somebody and they're negative without being experienced, conversation frame dissolves the weaker, stronger frame dissolves a weaker one. You are now stuck in their conversation in their frame. You are, you are unable to get it out of there. You have to just go with the flow. So one, Number two, wit. And when I talk about wit, I mean all of the components to it. There is so much art to great conversation that without experiencing it and learning about it, you're going to miss out. And when I say wit, I mean all the pieces that go come along with it, like sarcasm and irony and humor. And though and there's and it is displayed in so many different places. And you might be able to pick it up in reading a great novel and reading some great literature or reading a great tweet. But if you're nervous, if you have some anxiety going on and you're focused inward, you're unable to see those things. Number three, it's to be able to frame things properly so that you can articulate your vision or what it is that you are looking at to the person you're speaking with very important yeah it's hard to get your point across if it's the first time getting that point across so practicing becoming more experienced allows you to develop those skills being a great storyteller as we've covered in a toolbox <laughs> stories don't happen magically you have to practice you have to get in tune with the audience and be able to read people and that comes through experience I, I, and i every time i read one of these i know i can hear somebody in the audience thinking I do it great online. I'm a great storyteller when I'm writing these out or when my friends read my post. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about synchronous communication. Right. I mean, there's cadence, there's intonation as we've yes. heard. 
And here's the thing. You can get this experience relatively easily by talking to strangers. Yes. And that's really the goal of this episode is to understand whether you are experienced or inexperienced, you can gain these skills by opening up and talking to strangers. This is a big one. We did an episode about this and this is one of the most important components to great conversation, which is being able to identify and validate and roll with emotional bids. Yeah. Emotional <laughs> bids. It's when people are trying to connect with you. They are expressing themselves in emotional bids. Dr. John Gottman coined the term. We've talked about it a lot on the show and many of us have never encountered that phrase. We don't know what emotional bids are. And it's one of those powerful moments in boot camps where a light bulb goes off of like, now I see why my significant other was struggling to communicate with me or was frustrated with me or why I was fighting with my boss. I wasn't paying attention to the emotional bid. His attempt to connect with me was completely shut down because I was turning away from them. Yes. Uh, we had Michael Sorensen on who wrote the book. I hear you, which talks about these emotional bids and once again, when we do video work, we, the first thing that we ask is, okay, what were the emotional bids in that conversation? And the first answer usually is what? <laughs> because you've missed them all. And if you're missing emotional bids, you're not being able to validate the other person. Uh, flirting, you get better with flirting. When you get better with conversation, it goes with the wit and humor. Also your ability to critique somebody without criticizing them. Right. To actually have a spirited debate and discussion without turning it into a direct criticism of the other person or undercutting your argument. When you think about all of those components and all those skills that are able to be developed and cultivated and get to get better at communication. I mean, the, the opportunities that you have on your, through your daily and weekly routine to sharpen these skills are there in front of you. It's up to you of whether or not you are interested in getting better. Yeah. And we gave you some simple strategies that you can use this week. So take out the AirPods, pause the podcast and start talking to strangers. And you're going to start to see a world of opportunity socially, relationally, and professionally open up just by having more conversations with people you don't know. But I feel alive.